And Lisa, I'm going to mute you for just a little bit. Okay. Actually, I can't because Carrie's the host. Well, shouldn't I be muted the whole time Eric is talking like everybody else? Right. And I'll mute yeah. myself as soon as I'm done too. Okay. You just want to be sure you unmute yourself when you're presenting. Well, if I start talking and I'm not, you know, y'all talk to me and say, unmute. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Carrie, I believe we're ready. All right, so we got 43 people. All right, Carrie, I'm going to need you to make me the host. <laughs> there we go. All right. So hello everyone, how are you doing? My name is Nate Weston. I'm program coordinator with the Beaver Watershed Alliance. I wanna thank you for coming to attend. This is the, um, the first presentation in a series of workshops that we have put together for the uh, Alliance High, Tunnel, High Tunnels for Native Plant series. This is the first of four and uh, we're very excited to get this started. Um, for anyone who's wondering, this is a, a pilot program through the National or Natural Resources Conservation Service and it's through their um, Conservation Innovation Grant. Uh, the goal of this program, the primary goal, is to um, uh, get funding to construct 20 high tunnels in the Beaver Lake watershed for landowners to produce native plant materials for conservation purposes and uh, landscaping, engineering, and um, the larger goal is to have this program potentially be uh, adopted and have a a scenario in the NRCS high tunnel program for the growing of native plant materials as well as the current structure which allows for um, vegetables and cut flowers. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, start a presentation here shortly. Um, if you would, um, we welcome everyone to go ahead and uh, participate and engage in the Q&A section. You should see that at the bottom center of your screen. Um, there should be some, if you have any questions or anything like that, please feel free to enter, enter those there. Myself, uh, my co-host, Carrie, Lissa, or Eric, our two panelists, will answer those questions. And um, on the bottom right, you should see a chat window. There's a drop-down window on the bottom right of the screen, and uh, you should see an option to select all panelists and attendees. If you would, go ahead and, and turn that on. So if you ask a question, then the others of us can, can see that question too, and we can, we can respond, because otherwise then only, only the panelists and, you know, four of us would be able to see it, because uh, we got a lot of knowledgeable folks out here who uh, would be happy to answer those questions if it's something that's in a realm of their expertise. Um, I'm very excited. We have uh, a lot of interaction with uh, and a lot of registrations from folks all across the United States, so we've got quite a bit of interest in this program. We're very excited for the possibilities and potential. And uh, I'm just gonna go ahead and uh, go through a very, very brief presentation, just let you know uh, who the Beaver Watershed Alliance is, what we do as, a, as an organization. And uh, let's get that started. Can y'all see this? Okay, here we go. <clears throat> so this, uh, this program is the Alliance High Tunnels for Native Plants. Um, this particular session or this, um, this training is for native plants for builders and landscapers. And uh, this basically is uh, intended for the use of native plant materials and in, uh, in both you know, soft engineering for, for constructors, builders, and uh, as well as, as domestic and commercial landscapers. 
Um, we got two people, our panelists today are very knowledgeable on both these subjects and uh, we're looking forward to, to uh, this program. Sorry. All right, uh, some of our partners in this program are the NRCS, the Natu uh, Natural Resources Conservation Service. They're the primary funders for this organization through the uh, Conservation Inno Innovation Grant. And uh, one of our primary partners is Beaver Water District. They are one of the uh, larger water utility providers here in Northwest Arkansas and one of the, which is, uh, they draw their water from Beaver Lake, which is the drinking water source for uh, roughly half a million Arkansans. Um, we're also partnering on this program with the Ozark chapter of the Wild Ones, the Arkansas Master Naturalists, Missouri Wildflowers Nursery, and uh, Dripping Springs Garden, which is an organic commercial garden here in Northwest Arkansas. Uh, our mission is to pro proactively protect, enhance, and sustain the water quality in Beaver Lake and the integrity of its watershed. And we primarily do this through education, outreach, uh, technical assistance, and BMPs. BMPs stand for Best Management Practices, for those who don't know. Um, scientific monitoring and research. Uh, the Beaver Watershed Alliance is a 501c nonprofit organization. We're based in Springfield or Springdale, rather, Arkansas, and uh, uh, we ac primarily accomplish our goals for source water protection through education outreach, technical assistance, and uh, voluntary implementation of these best management practices and uh, scientific monitoring and research. Um, one of the primary issues we have up here in Northwest Arkansas. Uh, governing our source water protection is erosion. As you can see on this uh, slide in the top right, um, this is a heavily incised bank. And uh, one of the issues we have is uh, we have high flash, very, very uh, volatile streams, uh, very mountainous terrain. And uh, these streams up here in Northwest Arkansas can uh, go from a little trickle to, to a torrent in, in a very short amount of, of time. Uh, the Beaver Lake watershed is approximately 1,200 square miles, and our overall strategy is provided through the Beaver Lake watershed protection strategy, and that prioritizes the reduction of in-stream sediment loads in our various sub-watersheds. Um, you'll see over here on the left the outline of our program area and these uh, in these uh, outlined uh, sub-watershed units or hydrologic units. Um, the two reds are areas that have been designated for high priority due to sediment load. And uh, the orange or War Eagle Creek, as we call it, is uh, orange because it uh, has a moderate priority too. Um, one of the things we do is we work with uh, water, water utility providers in the area. And this just gives you an idea of all these colored blocks you see are areas uh, where water is drawn from Beaver Lake as designated by these blue triangles around the lake. And uh, this water is provided through water utilities to this entire region. Um, like I said, we have, it supplies about half a million residents. Um, this area is also the 14th fastest growing region in the United States. And so it's a very sensitive area in terms of ecology and um, uh, resource needs and uh, natural resource management. Um, like I said earlier, our primary, one of our primary ways of doing outreach is uh, through workshops like this one we're doing here, as well as farm field days. Uh, this picture was one of our uh, rain ready workshops where we work with landowners to educate them on the implementation of a voluntary best management practice of low, in, low impact developments, which is basically a way of, of making developments become more integrated with their natural landscape and natural features, natural uh, resources. So less pervious surfaces, uh, perme permeable pavers, um, native plants, which we'll talk about. That's a big role here. Um, as you can see, we work with some folks like from the Nature Conservancy as well as, as, well as other folks. Um, one of the things we do with landowners through, for technical assistance is we provide um, um, education and um, through landowner site assessments, we go out and we visit landowners on the properties, which may be anything from parcels or, or parcels, which may be forested, pasture, very hilly, flat, and have a, a variety of land use. Um, we let those landowners, we give them an idea of uh, various factors affecting their, uh, their land goals and their stewardship goals, such as erosion, uh, wildlife management, forest management, pasture management. 
And uh, we provide that as well as several other tools and, and education for the implementation of their, their voluntary implement uh, best management practices. Another thing we do is uh, we work with partners to restore stream banks in our watershed. Um, many folks will recognize this as natural channel designs, um, terracing of, of a stream, establishing a, a uh, structure in a stream that's been hev heavily incised and eroded and uh, stabilizing it with native plant materials as well as terracing and, and uh, in-stream features like J-hooks and, and uh, things like that. Uh, we do scientific monitoring. Just for one example is we do erosion monitoring. Here is one of our uh, eroded streams. I think this one might be in the War Eagle. And this is pretty common. We see uh, very flashy streams can rise up and uh, absolutely destroy a, a stream bank or a bank like that causes a lot of uh, erosion and decrease in water quality. Uh, <clears throat> we, do science, uh, we do scientific research as well. Uh, we have a, an ongoing uh, pond optimization project, which is basically a study to, to, to estimate the potential stormwater reduction uh, by the hypothetical installation of stormwater catchment ponds at various points in the watershed, particularly on a uh, first and uh, first order streams and, and lower. And uh, you know, you might be wondering like, where do plants fit in with all this? We're talking about best management practices and things like this in a, in a workshop that's tailored towards native plants and the propagation of them. And basically, every one of these things has, has a role in which native plants and native plant materials can, can have an impact whether it be through landscape gardens like this button bush and this, um, this butterfly that's on there, uh, voluntary um, tree plantings that we have throughout our watershed, seed collection events, um, pollinator plantings, riparian buffers, as well as low impact developments like we see down here in the bottom right. Um, we do this not just by ourselves, but with several key partners in the region. Um, some of these I'm sure y'all probably also have as partners as well. Uh, we are very, very thankful to our partners and we couldn't do anywhere near as much work uh, as we do without them. So we are very thankful to these, these folks for what, everything they do with us. Um, that's just a short presentation. I want to keep it short and simple and let my, my smarter folks, Lissa and Eric, talk about what they know. Um, my name again is Nate Weston. Uh, that's my number down below as well as my email contact. So if you have any questions, you can feel free to reach out to me. I'd be happy to uh, answer any questions or or delve any deeper into any of the content that I've covered in this. Um, I would also like to let everyone know that uh, this is, again, just one of four workshops in this series. Uh, we have one more. The, the second one is going to be on October 14th. Third is October 22nd. And fourth and final is going to be on October 28th. Um, every one of these workshops is tailored to a starting native plant producer. And basically, that's someone who may or may have a varying degree of knowledge in horticulture or native plants. They may have a, an excess or an abundance of knowledge in one or the other. And uh, we have uh, several participants in this program in our watershed who have received funds to construct a high tunnel and produce native plants through this program. We were very, very fortunate to have this opportunity. And we want to make sure they have every tool available at their disposal to make sure they're as successful as they possibly could be. And um, every one of these is tailored to a specific theme. Today's we're going to be talking about the native native plants for the builders and landscapers, and propagation and licensing, uh, economics and uh, of high tunnels, and as well as just the the operations of of running a high tunnel. So there's going to be quite a few different uh, variables and factors that go into this, and uh, you know they um, we're very excited to to be able to pr provide this opportunity. Again, this is part of a pilot program to encourage the uh, introduction of a scenario within the Conservation Innovation Grant, or rather within the National Resources Conservation Service High Tunnel Program of producing native plant materials through their very successful and very popular program. So I hope you all enjoy this and uh, register for the other workshops. We're very excited for it. So. Um, with that, I'm going to go ahead and uh, unshare my screen and turn this over, or rather, I'm going to introduce my uh, my friend and colleague, Eric. Um, so Eric Fusilier is an environmental project manager with Craft & Tull. 
he works with civil engineers and landscape architects to selectively plant uh, native plant materials suited for low impact development projects, um, craft and tall designs. Uh, Eric also serves as the president of, of the Ozark chapter of the Ozark Wild Ones. And uh, they are a volunteer organization dedicated to promoting environmentally sound landscaping practices and uh, preserving bio, or excuse me, and uh, preserving biodiversity through preservation, restoration, and uh, establishment of native plant communities. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and uh, turn my screen over to Eric. And Eric, you should be good to go whenever you're ready. Okay, Eric, you should be good to go now. That's my bad. I think Eric is having uh, mic issues. Okay, while, uh, while we're working through the technical issue there, um, I would like to just let everyone know again, there is a, uh, there should be a poll at the bottom. Can of you the hear screen. me now? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, I just had to barely plug it, unplug it and plug it back in. All right, we're rolling. <laughs> okay, uh, Eric, real quick, um, I just want to let everyone know there should be a, a Q&A at the bottom of your screen. If you have any questions, feel free to enter those in the Q&A section. This is different than the chat section. Um, one of the quirks with Zoom is um, it doesn't track any questions or answers put through the Q&A or put through the, the chat box rather. So if you would, if you have any questions, yeah, just like Chris just did, um, please just type it in the Q&A section. And with that, I'm going to mute myself and, and let you go, Eric. All right. Just testing that you can still hear me. Okay. All right, and I have a thing up here just telling me to unmute my speaker, and I'm not sure how to get that to go away. This is... All right, y'all can hear me now. Awesome, okay, here we go. <laughs> All right, got everything working. All right, thank you, Nate. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here and speak on uh, native plants uh, for various engineering applications. Uh, like Nate said, I um, am president of the local chapter of Wild Ones here in uh, Northwest Arkansas. Uh, Lisa and I both serve as officers in that chapter. Uh, also work with Craft and Toll and uh, we've uh, worked with Beaver Watershed Alliance on designing some low impact development park and lot projects for them uh, that included pervious pavers as well as uh, rain gardens and bioswells that include native plant species. So uh, as part of this um, high tunnel program, Nate asked me to come talk about various species of native plants that would have some applications for engineers and contractors. 
Uh, this will be a little bit different from my past presentations where I've discussed how to figure out where on the landscape you can apply uh, a particular species. Uh, this presentation, I'll mostly just be going through various species that can be used for uh, specific applications. That way the growers can kind of get a list of things that they might want to grow for the high tunnel program. And I'll be discussing three main areas. Uh, one will be native plants that could be used for erosion control. Uh, the second for improving stormwater quality and third for transp transportation and utility rights of way. So let's start off with some native plants that can be used for erosion control. So why is erosion an issue? Well, soil, uh, believe it or not, is a non-renewable natural resource. A uh, reason we consider this non-renewable is because it could take over 500 years to create an inch of topsoil and then 3,000 years to accumulate enough substances to make that soil fertile. So if we erode away all of the soil, it will not be renewed within our lifetimes. So one of the ways that we can use native plants for erosion control is for ground cover to create uh, to plant some species that create good ground cover. Uh, this helps slow down any runoff, uh, reduces rural and sheet erosion, and reduces the dislodging of soil particles due to wind and impacts from precipitation. Some good examples of native species for ground cover, uh, wild ginger. I have this, uh, does really well in shady areas. I have it planted underneath my deck. Uh, it seems to grow really well there, uh, produces really great ground cover, and also has these really nice little brown flowers that are, are almost purple, uh, very close to the ground. Common blue species that you see a lot here, um, it will grow in a lot of different varieties of situations, and um, yeah, this is um, one of my favorites in the springtime. And then wild strawberries, uh, these, uh, a, it will form really large mats. Uh, we have it out at our property. When we moved out there, there was already a pretty good population. Uh, another thing we noticed is that every spring when the strawberries are ripe, which we love to collect and eat ourselves, they taste delicious, just like your store bought strawberries. But we also noticed that we get a lot of box turtles, uh, or at least a couple box turtles that like to come visit our strawberry patch each year. So those are fun to watch. But these, yeah, these have three leaves, produce white flowers in about May, and then they'll produce some red strawberries in about June. Um, so they might not be the best ground cover if it's an area where you might be walking barefoot, uh, unless you don't mind you know, having red stained feet. Uh, then another good ground cover, Virginia creeper. A lot of people spend time trying to get this out of their yards, uh, and I can understand some people might not want it, you know, just covering everything. But it is good for, you know, locations where you might not be as concerned about um, it overtaking some places where you may have planted some other things. So it's also a host plant for some various uh, pollinating insects. And um, I really enjoy this plant. It turns a beautiful red this time of year. Uh, currently, if you look around, you might see some red Virginia creeper growing up a tree or on the ground. So what about slope stabilization? This is a little bit different uh, than ground cover. On slopes, you know, you have it at an angle and you need something that can handle a well-drained area. So the plants that we'll need to consider for uh, slope stabilization uh, we'll need to make sure they have deep roots to hold that soil in place. Uh, this also helps improve the soil's ability to absorb and filter water, which reduces runoff and thus reduces erosion. So other things to consider when selecting plants for uh, slope stabilization is to include species that are drought tolerant. If you look up the wetland indicator status uh, for a species, you would want it to be either what's called facultative upland or upland. You see the FACU or UPL uh, for the region in which you will be planting it. That will be a good indicator that it likes dry feet and handles uh, well-drained soil. Also deep-rooted species such as prairie grasses, trees, and shrubs uh, include a nurse crop uh, that can germinate that first year and help protect the perennials until they become established. So what are some native trees that we can use for slope stabilization? Uh, red maple, mockernut hickory, shortleaf pine, uh, common hackberry, and sassafras, uh, to name a few. What about some uh, shrubs? Well, the sumacs are usually pretty good. We have winged sumac, smooth sumac, and fragrant sumac. All of these seem to grow well on slopes. 
and um, yeah, can handle these well-drained areas. American Beauty Berry, this is another pretty one, also a great one for pollinators, and it produces these beautiful large clusters of purple berries that you should start seeing on these species about this time of year. If you're out hiking around, you might run into one of these. Native grasses, uh, a lot of our prairie grasses, like I said, have very deep root systems. And we have what's known as the big four. I'm only showing three here. Uh, Indian grass, little blue stem, and big blue stem. Uh, switchgrass would be one of the others from the big four. It usually likes a little bit wetter conditions than the three I have listed here, so at least in this part of the country. So I did not show it uh, for use for slope stabilization, but we will discuss it here in a little bit. Also here are some uh, Virginia wild rye or wild ryes. Those are uh, cool season grasses, whereas the big blue stem, little blue stem, Indian grass, these are all warm season grasses. So a lot of times when we're talking about erosion control, you know, depending on the time of year uh, you're putting out that seed, you might want to have a mix of cool and warm season grasses in your seed mix. Uh, that way you can ensure that some things are starting to grow um, sooner, uh, maybe even over the winter time and starting to get their start. Uh, side oats, grandma, and purple top are two other of our native grasses that would do really well in these conditions. And then some wildflowers, or what's known as forbs. Uh, pale purple cone flower does really well in dry conditions and full sun. Purple cone flower uh, usually does better in some partial shade, but it can handle some full sun. And then white heath aster, which is blooming all over right now. And I've noticed that bu uh, monarch butterflies seem to really like the white heath, heath aster as they're migrating, uh, at least through our property. We notice uh, quite a few on these plants, which we have growing all over the place. Native Forbs um, for slope stabili stabilization, butterfly milkweed, uh, green milkweed. These are two common ones we see al growing along roadsides uh, and wild bergamot. And then Canada Goldenrod, Black-Eyed Susans, and Lanceleaf Coreopsis. These are three yellow flowering species. Uh, the, the goldenrod that's blooming around now, the lanceleaf coreopsis and black-eyed susans, those are about done blooming. Uh, they bloom earlier in the year, like late summer, early, or late spring, early summer. And, and a word of warning on uh, some of the species I'm gonna go over here. They, <clears throat> some of these are pretty aggressive, like the goldenrod. And so Lissa's topic is gonna be more on, you know, species that will be good for a landscaping type environment. What I'm considering here is things that are gonna be out in the wild, maybe even not, you know, well monitored or managed. So we, you know, want in these situations some aggressive species that can help compete with the invasives and help uh, suppress any woody species that may grow or compete with them, and like in the right of ways. Hairy mountain mint, another great one. Giant ironweed, another one that's blooming around now, uh, produces these purple flowers that butterflies love, and Illinois bundle, bundle flower. Some more yellow species, Maximilian sunflower, showy tick seed, which is blooming now, and partridge pea. Partridge pea is one of our native legumes, and it's also an annual, so it will um, flower that first year you plant it, and it will reseed itself. All right, stream bank stabilization. So what are some things that we need to consider for stream bank stabilization? Well, again, we need deep rooted uh, vegetation and we need to select species that can handle the periodic flooding that often occurs uh, along riparian areas and stream banks. If you notice in this picture uh, where the erosion's occurring, uh, the, the grasses don't look to be very deep rooted. It looks like it's pretty short, shallow rooted and I'd imagine that's um, not helping hold that bank in place. So what about some native trees for lower down, closer to the river? What I have is the lower bank. Uh, red maple, black willow, bald cypress, water hickory, an American sycamore, and sugarberry. Sugarberry looks very similar to hackberry. They're in the same genus, uh, but the, one of the differences is the position on the landscape, you'll often find these two species. Hackberry likes a little drier feet. Sugarberry likes a little bit wetter feet. About some native trees for the upper bank, uh, a little bit further away from periodic flooding, uh, black cherry, red mulberry, common hackberry, that's the one that's related to sugarberry, uh, sassafras, and oak species. We have many species of oaks here uh, in Arkansas that are native to this region that could be used 
for string banks and riparian plantings. Oaks are also great for supporting a wide array of uh, species of pollinating insects. So species that can go on either the upper or lower bank, these are a little more versatile. Uh, river birch, common persimmon, sweet gum, black gum, and American elm. All right, what about some shrub species for stream banks? All right, I got the red box around the ones that will need to be placed lower on the landscape, the lead plant and the button bush. These like very wet feet. Uh, I believe button bush is considered an obligate wetland plant. So you'd wanna make sure that it's down there where it's getting water uh, pretty regularly. Common elderberry, spice bush, and Ozark witch hazel can be placed low on the spring, uh, stream bank or a little bit higher up. And then coral berry, strawberry bush, and common nine bark are able to be placed a little bit higher up on that bank further away from the creek. So what about some grasses for stream banks? Uh, well, river oats, that's a common one that you'll see. Uh, that they provide a lot of great winter aesthetic too. So there's some landscape uh, application, I believe, for this species. Uh, and reed canary grass, these are two species that are often seen growing along rivers. Again, some cool season grasses, Virginia wild rye, bottle brush grass, and Canadian wild rye. These are all in the wild rye genus. Uh, I like bottle brush grass because if you've ever had a baby or a bottle brush, uh, you'll know why they, they call it that. Uh, the seed heads look like a bottle brush. One of the main differences between Canadian wild rye and Virginia wild rye are the seed heads on Canadian wild rye kind of droop over, whereas Virginia wild rye, they stand upright. All right, switchgrass, uh, I said it likes a little bit wetter feet, uh, and eastern gamma grass. One great thing about switchgrass is it sucks up a lot of nutrients. So if you have a farm field, say, uh, that you're applying fertilizer to or manure of some kind, then if you planted switchgrass along the stream bank uh, next to that farm field, uh, not only would it help control or stop any sediment that might wash off your farm field before going into the creek, but it also helps take up a lot of that extra nitrogen, uh, prevent it from entering the waterways and creating nutrient pollution issues like eutrophication, which can occur when there's too much, too many nutrients in our water. All right, what about improving stormwater quality with native plants? How can we do this? Uh, well, stormwater runoff, like Nate mentioned, uh, occurs when we have impervious surfaces that block the rain from soaking into the ground. So since it can't soak in, it has to go sideways or really uh, trying to find the lowest elevation. So in urban areas where we've had higher concentrations of impervious surfaces, water flows at higher speeds and in larger quantities after we have these rains. So you get what we call these flashy flows. So normally all of this water you see here would have soaked into the ground over a wider area, but it gets concentrated um, and creates these issues. Goes to the nearest storm drain. This helps transfer the storm water away from homes and streets, uh, reduces flooding and helps keep us all safe. But why does this matter? Well, these pipes, these storm drains, typically carry water directly to the local creeks and streams without being treated. Uh, many people mistakenly believe that that water is treated before it's put back out in the environment. Well, usually, no, it's not. So these flashy flows accelerate erosion to uh, beyond what are natural levels of erosion. These, uh, this increases the turbidity levels in our creeks and streams and can uh, contribute to the loss of property and even income. Also, polluted water can affect our drinking water resources. So what can we do with native plants? Uh, well, we got the three S's of stormwater management. Soak it up, spread it out, slow it down. And one way we can do that is with rain gardens. Rain gardens are shallow constructed depressions that have been planted with deep rooted perennial flowers and native vegetation and they're strategically located to accept the runoff from impervious surfaces such as roofs, parking lots, streets, uh, driveways, etc. Once it accepts this stainless uh, storm water, it typically holds it, fills up with a few inches of water, um, prevents it from uh, flowing on, kind of contains it, and allows it to slowly uh, soak into the ground. Bioswells, these transfer water from one place to another. 
these often have a drain at one end that accepts the water uh, that does not infiltrate. Uh, these can be planted with grasses, shrubs, perennials, or any combination of these. So basically think of a, uh, a heavily vegetated uh, swell, uh, drainage swell, that is meant to kind of help slow down and filter that water as it's flowing from one point to another. So with native plants, uh, we can use what's called phytoremediation or the use of plants to uh, clean up the environment. Plants are great at remediating low levels of petroleum contamination in soil, for instance. So it's often contained in the runoff from uh, parking lots, for instance, or roads. You're going to have a little bit of drippings of motor oil and other petroleum products, automobile fluids and whatnot. Well, all plants have the ability to break down low levels, low to moderate levels of uh, petroleum contamination. That's so and the way they do this is by exuding substances from their roots in the root zone under the ground uh, that stimulates microbial activity. So all these microbes around the root zone of the plant start, there's going to be some species within that that can break down uh, the petroleum. If we think about petroleum as a hydrocarbon, it's carbon based and there are some species of microorganisms that it serves as food for. Uh, so over time and the stress, this is really can only be applied to low levels of petroleum contamination, but um, if you plant these species next to a parking lot, they will help break down the uh, any contamination that might occur in the soil. Now, the one of the things that makes native species especially great at this is that their root systems are very fibrous. A lot of our native grasses especially have very fibrous root systems. You can see this picture um, in the root system there. So what you have is a greater surface area associated with these root systems than you would say with say a taproot type system. And so with this greater surface area, that's a greater volume of the soil where these microbes are active and helping break down these hydrocarbons. Uh, so that makes them better and more efficient at purifying the soil than plants that have um, thicker root systems that are less fibrous. So what are some native trees uh, that can help remediate petroleum contamination in soil? Uh, common hackberry, we see that one again, eastern redbud, black willow, willow oak, eastern cottonwood, and black locust. What about some native grasses? Uh, here's some of our prairie grasses, Indian grass, switchgrass, and big blue stem. Here's blue grandma grass. Uh, this is another one that they've done studies on uh, with its ability to degrade petroleum. Prairie cordgrass, eastern gamma grass, which is a relative to the ancestor of corn. Interesting fact about that plant. Here's our bottle brush grass, one of our wild rye. This is a cool season grass. Uh, tussock sedge. Here's one of our sedges. So maybe you have some wet, wetter soil that you're needing. Uh, remediated. Green bulrush and soft rush, also known as common rush. This is one of the more common species of rushes that you'll see. And I do have a research for each of these species. If anyone is interested, um, feel free to get a hold of me and I'll be happy to send that research over to you. All right, what about native species of wildflowers or black-eyed Susans, New England aster. New England aster is one that's blooming now, so beautiful purple flower and also great for pollinators. Butterfly milkweed and swamp milkweed. Now butterfly milkweed, it does like drier feet. Swamp milkweed, it likes wetter feet, but both prefer full sun. Purple cone flower, prairie blazing star and Ohio spiderwort. All beautiful species. And our two lobelias, cardinal flower and great blue lobelia. Both of these like some wet feet. Uh, you'll see these in bloom late summer as you're hiking or floating down creeks. And again, our American beautyberry. And she is a beauty. All right, so what about native plants for right, rights of ways? Like, so when we're considering right aways we need to think about short-term maintenance during startup. It does usually take three years to get everything established, but once it is established, it's pretty low maintenance. 
And that's really what makes it ideal because it, we could spend a lot of time and money on trying to have crews going out and maintaining these. But if we can find something that is just low maintenance, uh, that can help save our public agencies and county road departments, municipalities some money. So we do need to think about the size of the plant at maturity. Uh, we don't want to create any issues with site distance. Uh, and we also need to leave spaces for motorists to pull over uh, in the event of an accident or uh, emergency of some kind. So some roadside uh, plants um, for roadsides and medians, uh, Virginia wild rye, bottle brush grass and Canadian wild rye, Indian grass, Again, switchgrass and big blue stem. These are three of our big four grasses. Plains Coreopsis, uh, Lanceleaf Coreopsis, and Black Clyde Susans. Uh, the Plains Coreopsis and Lanceleaf Coreopsis, they both bloom early summer, and, along with the Black Eyed Susans. Yarrow and Hairy Mountain Mint. Again, butterfly milkweed and green milkweed, common roadside plants. And then above ground utilities. We don't wanna have woody species in these. We spend a lot of, or our utility companies uh, spend you know, quite a bit of money and funds trying to suppress the woody species growing under, underneath power lines. Uh, so we wanna use aggressive native species that can keep the evasives at bay and also uh, suppress these woody species. Also, drought-tolerant species that like either full or partial sun. Uh, for wide right-of-ways, you might have, uh, you'll probably have uh, plants towards the center that would prefer full sun, uh, but closer to the edge, so they're going to need a little bit of that partial, they're going to need to be able to handle some partial shade. So what about some native grass species for above ground utilities? Uh, Indian grass, again, purple top. This is one that just finished um, going to seed. Uh, I really like purple top, it produces these purple seed heads. Uh, and also another name for it is grease grass because if you run your hands along the sweet, uh, seed head, it produces little greasiness on your hands. Uh, and big blue stem, Virginia wild rye, switch grass and Canadian wild rye. Hairy mountain mint, white heath aster, and Illinois bundle flower. And again, we got some aggressive goldenrods in here, Canada goldenrod and lake goldenrod, uh, and giant ironweed. Maximilian sunflower, showy tick seed, which like I said before is blooming now, and partridge pea, one of our annual legumes. Again, black-eyed Susan, and lanceleaf coreopsis. All right, so what about underground utilities? Well, again, we don't want woody species. We need to think about root depth. Uh, we don't, you know, if you have a pipeline or something, they typically don't want the roots growing into that. Uh, we need to, again, use aggressive natives that can compete with the invasives and suppress woody species. And we also want species that are drought tolerant, that like full or partial sun. So again, Indian grass, little blue stem, big blue stem. I pulled these species from a seed mix I found uh, for pipeline right of ways. So my understanding is these do have deep root systems, but um, my guess is that the roots aren't a threat to pipelines. I am not certain about that. I will be totally honest with you there. Uh, Virginia wild rye, switchgrass and purple top. Canada goldenrod, white heath aster and lake goldenrod. Like the golden rods are not, these golden rods in particular are not great for a home garden. Uh, Alyssa will probably tell you about. Uh, she has developed a wonderful list of well-behaved native species that uh, do well in a home garden and don't get out of control. These, however, you know, these would be ideal for a place that's a little more remote, uh, where it's gonna be less monitoring, uh, less maintenance going on. Purple cone flower, New England aster, um, and again, blazing star, not one of my favorites. Hairy Mountain Mint and Gray-Headed Coneflower. Lanceleaf Coreopsis, and there's our Partridge Pea, our annual legume, or one of our annual legumes. All right, and that concludes my presentation, so I'm gonna hand it back over to Nate. I appreciate you letting me speak.
Well, thanks, Eric. That was a very informative presentation. Um, there were some questions that came up in the Q&A. Uh, some folks were wondering if these presentations would be made available in a PDF form or anything like that. Um, we don't have any intention of making them available in a hard copy like that or in a PDF form, but um, if you are a registrant and you are watching this presentation right now through Zoom, uh, and you have that registration link, you can still access the program and the uh, presentations by Zoom. And uh, within within a, a five, five business days or something like that, we should have this uploaded to our, uh, our YouTube page with the Beaver Watershed Alliance, and uh, you can watch it there as well and uh, see see all the presentations. I'm also happy to share my slides if anyone wants to reach out or if you want to send them out, I can make them available too. That's always good. <clears throat> and I believe we can do the same. And um, All right, uh, I'm going to stay here. Um, We were intending on taking a 10 minute break at about 2.50. So I'm just gonna stay here and uh, manage the Q&A section. Um, does anyone have any questions for Eric or potentially Lisa or myself? Some of the, some of the and, and words that were mentioned may not be clear to everyone. Like what is, what is a naturalizing species or you know, what, makes, what makes a plant well behaved, which is something Lisa will talk about later uh, sometimes Sometimes one species may be good in one location because it it's it stays in one spot, and sometimes it may be good in a in another location because it spreads aggressively. So, <clears throat> uh, who has recommendations for home gardens? Was asked by by Grace. Um, I would say Lissa's probably got some great recommendations for that, especially based on um, specific types of home gar home gardens. Uh, typically, if you see a plant that's listed as uh, having a tendency to naturalize, it means it is a fairly hardy and robust and uh, competitive plant. And um, that has that has mixed uses. Uh, some locations you you may want that, like if it's um, if it's out in a prairie restoration site and it's a native species that's prone to being somewhat aggressive, like common milkweed or a lot of mountain mints. Um, those can hold their own pretty well against many many uh, other invasive exotics. Um, other species may tend to not be, you know, like spring, spring ephemerals, things like that, tend to not spread that much and be considered uh, naturalizing or, or colonizers, <clears throat> excuse me, or aggressive. Uh, Audrey is asking, um, can it be done on a new construction site right away, or is it usual, or is it more usual to work on already established sites with water improvement problems? And if so, who would be one to reach out to start a project? Um, if it's in if it's in our watershed, I would be happy to work with you on that. Uh, outside of that, I would recommend if you're in Arkansas, talking to the um, local extension office, and uh, they can work with you on that too. Um, for wells and well pumps, supplying water over 100 feet deep. Um, most tree roots don't usually go that deep. I, I can't think of a species off the top of my head that is that, that aggressive that with, with roots that run that deep. Uh, um, some species can, can affect a well. Um, some species like um, some exotic willows, like uh, weeping willow is, is notorious for having pretty aggressive roots. Uh, silver maple is the same. It's a native species, but it has fairly shallow and aggressive roots, uh, as well as others. Um, there again, these are these are great species, but sometimes they may or may not work uh, well in in that particular location. <clears throat> um, Gwen is asking if there's a chart listing species with check marks for characteristics such as wet feet, aggressive, and etc. Um, that is something that we've considered. Oh, Liz is shaking her head, nodding. So yes. So she's worked on that. Uh, I don't know that much about sand love purple grass. I don't know if that's a, if that's purple muley or if that's something else I'm, I'm thinking of. And uh, okay, it's 1249. Um, we had intended to take a 10 minute break. Um, so if everyone wants to just go ahead and get up, stretch your legs. Um, I'm going to stay here. And uh, some folks have 
the have entered questions into the q and I'll, I'll respond to those as much as I can and uh, engage folks on here. Um, we did intend to be back at about in about 10 minutes at three o'clock. So again, just get up, stretch your legs. <laughs> Don't work on deep, deep vein thrombosis or anything like that. Because getting up and moving around is good for you. Uh, there again, so um, if you have any questions, feel free to answer those in the chat window. Uh, uh, so for folks who live in our watershed, um, we do have this grant program that is available. Uh, we do st still have some applications open to receive uh, up to $4,000 for a high tunnel. But uh, again, it is only available to landowners in the Beaver Lake watershed. Um, if you think you might live in the watershed and you might be eligible for that, you can feel free to reach me at my contact information, nate at beaverwatershedalliance.org. Um, I would be happy to work with you on, on that, uh, doing an application or, or any land questions you might have or, or potential best management practices you may be looking to implement, or even if you just want recommendations, or if you just want to ask me what this plant is, I'd be happy to, to work on that as well with you. Um, we, uh, we do have seeds available for the awardees of this program. We are working with them to supply the native plant materials necessary to get them off the ground and get them to producing and make sure their, their business model is, is successful as much as we can. We're, we have, um, kind of a hands-off approach with, with the awardees of this program, many of whom are, are participating today and, uh, we're, doing our best to just facilitate their success. Um, I, there are many vendors out there, um, one of whom is, I would highly recommend, Missouri Wildflower Farms is going to be on here. Uh, one of the later presentations, um, Mervyn Wallace is an expert uh, in the subject. He's got over 35 years of experience cultivating and propagating native plant materials in, in a series of high tunnels and greenhouses he has up in uh, southeast Missouri, I believe. Um, others that, that we often recommend are ones like um, Roundstone Native Seed Company in Kentucky and uh, some locals here in Arkansas are um, uh, White River Nursery in Elkins and uh, Pine Ridge Gardens in London, Arkansas. And I'm sure, you know, some of the, for some of the folks who are not from Arkansas, then uh, I'm sure there's, there's some in your states too. Um, many states have a Native Plant Society. So if you just search your state with Native Plant Society, you'll probably you'll probably find in it a group, as well as uh, some recommendations. Um, Arkansas is blessed. We have a, a state chapter, Arkansas Native Plant Society, as well as a sub chapter up here in the Ozarks, uh, with the Ozark chapter of the Arkansas Native Plant Society. So you can get a lot of good resources, recommendations, and information from them. <clears throat> Um, recommendations for home gardens. I would talk with a with a local landscape architect, or you know, Lissa's Lissa's an expert on that. And like I said, she's going to be able to talk about that a lot more in depth than I could. I'm a, I'm a plant ecologist, and and uh, I have I have my garden, but it's it's not pretty. <laughs> But uh, it's full of native plant species and uh, and pollinators and butterflies and caterpillars and things like that. So it keeps me happy. <clears throat> All right. Um, Lissa, do you feel comfortable? Just go ahead and well, let's let's wait a little bit. So let me let me just ask in the Q and A um, or in the chat rather, what are some some interests some of some of y'all would have in uh, in a uh, in a high tunnel program? What, what kind of goals would you see for that? And um, you know how how many of y'all would be would be uh, producers or consumers or or whatever for for such a program. Oh, 
Okay, and uh, Chris was saying in the chat, um, he, he was under the impression his application was complete on time. Uh, Chris, I do have your application. Um, we have two rounds of awardees that we are going through. Uh, we have completed the first round of awardees and we're helping them get through <clears throat> get through this program for this fall and, uh, and winter. And uh, we'll be looking at a second round of applicants um, in the latter part of next year. So we do, ha we do have that application. Um, it looks like you were successful in registering for the webinar. <clears throat> so Lisa, would you would you want to chime in and talk about any any plant species that are just your favorites? Hmm. <laughs> can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Um, well, I, I think I'll cover some of that when I start talking. Some of my yeah. favorites, it just depends on, you know, what it's being used for. Um, Indian pink is one of my favorites. I love that one. It's not, you don't see it out and, and it'll be in some of my slides that I talk about. Let's see. Um, at the end of my whole presentation, I have what I call a wish list and I'm gonna direct it to the growers <laughs> because <laughs> it's the, the, some of the plants that I, I know would work well for landscaping and they're hard to find or too small. <clears throat> so I'll cover some of that. And when, we, when uh, everybody is ready to join us and we get going again, I think we could get started. Well, are we a little, let's see, my computer says we got four more minutes till it's through. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't realize how long 10 minutes was until I had to sit through it. <laughs> so do you, do you propagate any plants? Do I? Yeah. Not anymore. I used to, that's okay. what I did for years and years. It wasn't natives back when I was propagating. Uh -huh. Um, uh, but I have some background in propagating plants. We had a wholesale plant nursery and then we had a uh, retail store. The White River Nursery was the store that we started in, um, oh, it was uh, almost 20 years ago. So um, I do have, that's one of the things that I was going to talk about, that my background is in nursery and landscaping business and uh, but ever since, um, oh, for almost 20 years, I've been interested in, in just prop, not propagating, but uh, promoting native plants and landscaping with native plants. And now that I'm retired, that's all I talk about, nothing else. <laughs> I had the opportunity to go to Alyssa's house not long ago and see her beautiful landscaping uh, that she's done out there. Uh, it's really impressive. I think my favorite part is her, her uh, moth. I'm sorry, her moss pathways. She has a little extensive network of moss paths out here. Her yes, I place. do. That was kind of by accident, but it, it is beautiful and striking and almost everybody comments on it when they come visit and the moss and they want to know how I grow moss, but it was accident that I learned how. Does it, should I tell people how to get moss going right now? I think you should. Okay, it requires poor soil, compacted soil, at slightly acid is probably its favorite pH, which I have all of. I have poor, compacted, acid soil. I'm uh, on top of a mountain with lots of oak trees and hardwood, typical hardwood forest. And the thing you have to do is keep the leaves, all, you know, that's the place where I wanted paths that I would rake the leaves off into the brush so that the paths would be clear and not slippery. And lo and behold, moss will grow. And of course we've had wet enough years that uh, the more moisture we have, the more it grows uh, prolifically in the early spring and then uh, anytime it's moist and then it kind of goes through a dormancy as soon as things dry up and as soon as it rains again 
it begins to spread again. So it's all about keeping uh, um, organic matter off of the paths like leaves and then the moss will grow in poor, compacted, um, P high pH soil. And that's about it. I really kind of lucked into it by accident. <clears throat> you answering questions to people, Nate? Yeah. Uh, pokeweed is a chop and drop mulch. I've never heard of that before. What? Uh, pokeweed as a chop and drop mulch. Interesting. I've never heard of that. <laughs> okay. It seems like it would go to seed and you'd have a pokeweed patch. <laughs> <laughs> let, me, let me answer a question real quick and uh, we'll go ahead and get started again. Okay. Should I go ahead and share my screen? Not yet. Uh, not yet. Um, okay. We do have uh, everyone. There should be a poll available in the bottom two um, during the presentation. Just feel free to to access that and uh, and uh, provide any answers. Um, folks should be getting back from from the break right now. Um, Lisa, I'm just going to go ahead and introduce you. And after I'm done, you can go ahead and uh, share your screen and. Uh, <clears throat> All right, so this is Lisa Morrison. She is a uh, vice president of the Ozark Wildlands. Uh, Lisa has been in the horticulture industry for 35 plus years uh, with a wide range of experience uh, owning a wholesale plant nursery, as many of y'all just heard. Um, she <clears throat> a uh, residential landscaping business, a retail garden center. Uh, for eight years, Lisa was on the horticulture staff at the Botanical Garden of the Ozarks in uh, Fayetteville, Arkansas. She was the horticulture and, and uh, or excuse me, the, she was the horticulture supervisor and garden designer for the last four years before she retired in 2018. Uh, works with the Arkansas Native Plant Society Education uh, Committee and is vice president of the uh, Wild Winds at Ozark chapter. And uh, she continues teaching and promoting the use of native plants in, in uh, her presentations and her, her outreach and education. And uh, Lisa, with that, I'm going to go ahead and mute myself and uh, turn this over to you. Whoops. It's, let's see. Hmm. Okay, so I'm working on figuring out how to get my um, slides up big right now. Can you, what do you see in front of you, Nate? Unmute, Nate, I need you to talk to me to get this PowerPoint pulled up. Oh, sorry. Um, I just see yourself right now. Uh, you should okay. see a share screen at the bottom of your, your screen here. Okay, I hit that and, and uh, it, it, you should see if you have your presentation open, you should see it come up as an option. Yes. Uh -huh. And if you click on that. Okay, I had to double click. Go. You had to there double click on that. Yeah. Got it. And okay. don't be like me and don't put your presentation in presentation mode because that doesn't work. <laughs> okay. <laughs> everyone sees, everyone All right. So uh, let me see if we can go from, if we can get going here from the beginning. Yeah, here we go. Can you hear me and see the um, presentation? Yeah, it looks beautiful. Okay. All right, then we'll get going. So thanks everybody for coming and for my opportunity to talk with you. I'm glad to be here today. And some of you just heard that I, my background is in nursery and landscaping business. I have been interested in promoting plants for almost 20 years now. And I've been studying native plants and how they work in landscape settings. <clears throat> Places like public gardens, residential home landscapes, and even commercial landscapes. So my focus has been what I call well-behaved natives. Native plants that work better when the wilder look is not appropriate. And today I'm going to focus on selecting well-behaved native plants for landscaping. So I like to start off with, let me with showing a couple of slides that show 
one this these are this you're looking at 100 percent native plants in this landscape you can see that it's intentional looking and it's tidy uh, this is what i like to promote and encourage people to uh, figure out how to landscape with native plants this is another shot and both of those were at the botanical garden of the ozarks everybody wants to know what this one is let me see if i can get my arrow working there you go that's white baptisia, it's quite striking. Um, <clears throat> another nice looking, tidy looking landscape, very intentional looking. All of these are well-behaved natives and I'll get into that more, except this one right here, which is, uh, that's gray dogwood and it is not well-behaved. Um, it is a great native plant, uh, but not necessarily should be in a manicured garden. This is also a, a, a couple of years, this slide, I took it a couple of years after the first two. Uh, the fringe tree has gotten much bigger here and it's just really striking and attractive. This blooming over here, we have yellow Baptisia and blue Amsonia, Arkansas blue star is the common name. But what I want you to look at and notice in this slide is the that it's uh, mulched it looks like a well-behaved and sort of manicured and intentional garden uh, it is full of many well-behaved native plants i want to show you one more slide and this is this is also at the botanical gardens this has a little bit of story behind it this slide i was taken up i took it about five years after the that garden at the botanical gardens the one that is called the natives garden was designed and planted and when it was designed the um <clears throat> excuse me the the intention back then uh, the attitude was to let it go let the public see what native plants do and this is what happened after about four or five years uh, it became just really overgrown. And so when I started working at the Botanical Gardens, I really wanted to tackle this garden and show people what a intentional, nice looking landscape could look like, more like this and not like that. It is probably one of, now that has its place in the wild setting, but certainly not in a more manicured setting. Uh, it's one of my personal missions in life to help people avoid this look. Now, this is an extreme look. I have to acknowledge that that's an extreme example, but I see lots of messy native gardens. And so that's what I hope to help with a little bit today to avoid this. And I think in, uh, um, we need to focus a little bit on the how-to of gardening with native plants so that uh, if the goal is to be attractive but also supportive of healthy ecosystems i gave it some thought and i came up with really it's four things that we need to pay attention to this fifth one down here is specifically talking to uh, the people that are in the high tunnel program and i will get to that as we move along here but <clears throat> when i think about how it is that we end up with attractive looking native gardens uh, these are the four things that i would focus on to to have attractive gardens that look intentional with native plants so what do i uh when i'm talking about paying attention to your site i've got a couple of examples here the red lobelia one of my favorite perennials in the that's a native uh, i love this plant but as i said some of you heard me say during the break that i live on top of a dry rocky poor soil shallow soil mountaintop and most of the time you find lobelia growing along creeks or in ditches where there's some moisture so if i go to a uh, a native plant sale or a garden center and buy this plant, I'm gonna struggle to find a spot where that is gonna work on my property. Uh, it has to be moist or I'm gonna have to be watering it every day. So paying attention to your site and your soil is a, uh, one of the keys to success. Uh, this is wild cream indigo or a type of Baptisia. It grows naturally on my place. 
and uh, this likes dry, rocky, shallow soils. So this one works for me almost anywhere I put it, unless I put it in a, uh, a bed that I have enriched and improved, which is what I did the first time I, I dug some of this off of my own property and moved it into a flower bed that I had been adding compost and mulch to. And it promptly died within two years because this plant prefers, uh, the, the Baptisia prefers poor, uh, shallow, it, did, it resented the rich soil, so it did not do well. The point being, if you can mimic and first of all, research the plant and learn what its natural habitat is, and then try to imitate that somewhat in your own landscape or yard, you will be more successful with your native plants. So learning the natural habitat of the native plant is important. Here's another example of the same thing. I decided I want some spice bush in my yard, which really is very much woodsy, just like this shot. <clears throat> spice bush is often found along the creek bottoms in, a, in some moisture, but I decided to try it anyway because I really want to have spice bush swallowtail butterflies around my, in my setting. So I will just have to give this a more extra water, especially during the dry seasons. And I do think it'll get established, but it'll take longer. It won't grow as big as it does in the wild, maybe. And I will have to baby it with some extra water. So those are all things to think about as you are choosing native plants. Uh, particularly for more uh, uh, manicured looking landscapes. Another example is the blue sage. It, it would grow well in shallow or dry rocky soil, but I put it in what is now my butterfly garden. That spot used to be my vegetable garden, so I have spent many, many years enriching that soil. The books will tell you that blue sage will grow about four or five feet tall, mine grew seven or eight because it was too rich and then it promptly flopped over. So again, I did not mimic it how it grows naturally and because of that, it is too floppy. So uh, about, I wanted to mention ornamental or native grasses that are used as an ornamental grass and there are many choices for that. Uh, there are, there's really no excuse for using non-native grasses when you finally get to know the native grasses and how attractive they can be in a landscape. But if, the, if you are reading and researching about this plant and it says full sun to part sun, I recommend full sun because it, as soon as you put the grasses that, pref the prairie grasses in particular that prefer full sun, and you don't give it full sun, then it will be floppy. And a, a floppy grass in an ornamental setting is not very attractive. So um, pay attention to the, and there are some grasses that grow in shade, uh, but you need to pay attention to those conditions. So what do I mean by having a plan? Uh, this shot right here is a friend of mine who asked for some help with their yard and they had, live in a small typical, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, they live in a small typical subdivision yard house with a typical size yard. And the, all around their house, they had the typical foundation plants. And they said, decided that what they wanted to do was tackle one bed at a time, take out all the non-natives and replace it with native plants. I thought this was an excellent way to go about this in their yard it's, it, and not make mistakes, not waste money, not plant something and then realize that it's in the wrong place. Uh, native plants, some of them that do not have tap roots, deep tap roots, you can transplant them. But if, once, if it does have a deep tap root, then you're going to have trouble or you probably will kill it if you try to transplant it. So knowing where you're headed with your plant, this is one of the things I see is that people 
uh, have gotten more and more excited about native plants and use them in landscaping. And I am very excited about that. I've been talking about native plants, as I said, for almost 20 years. And 20 years ago, I couldn't get anyone to talk to me. And I have just seen a sea change of interest in the last five to 10 years with people. And in the last five years in particular, people wanting to literally landscape their yards with native plants, but they don't really know how to go about it. And, and so they end up making a lot of mistakes. Having a plan, thinking about it and researching it will make a big difference. <clears throat> this is the one that I think trips people up the most, and I uh, and it is, it's unfortunate that even though native plants have been around for hundreds of years, uh, we don't know these plants. Uh, like, unfortunately, we have been landscaping our yards and our manicured settings with imported plants for more than a couple of hundred years. Ever since we came across the big ocean, we have been bringing plants with. Uh, humans brought plants across the ocean and, and used them to beautify our spaces. And we, so this is a new thing for us to start using native plants to beautify our homes and our businesses and our landscapes. So here's an example of what I mean. Both of these are Blazing Star. Blazing Star is an excellent pollinator plant. This one is one of the, this is the prairie blazing, blazing star on your left, and it is one of the taller uh, Leatrice out there. And I think this is excellent looking at the botanical gardens, but you really have to plan for something to be that big and that sprawling in a native, in a manic in a designed garden. This one here is only two, about two feet tall, and you can see it has a much more tidy look. Now, of course, you can design this in if you know what you're doing, but if you put that in a flower bed and you're not expecting this, then you're probably going to be disappointed. So researching plants is the key to being successful with using native plants and landscapes. Um, some of these were mentioned by Eric. The purple top grass was one that was mentioned. These are some uh, herbaceous perennials, mostly, except for this grass. And most of these reseed rampantly. There is a much longer list of reseeding um, native plants. As Eric said, I thought it was a great point. If you're reading about native plants, and I think the word he used was Oh, you, if you read that that native plant naturalizes, that's a good uh, hint that it, it might reseed rampantly. That's kind of another, another term for reseeding rampantly. A, a good example of making an educated choice about the species that you're picking, this is be a type of bee balm or monarda. This particular one is uh, Monarda fistulosa, and the common name is wild bergamot. Excellent plant. It blooms a long, long time, so I like to get it in everywhere I can because it has such a long blooming period. But it, it spreads by runners and it reseeds, so I would never design this into a flower bed. Um, the one I would choose that is a little more well behaved is called uh, Bradburiana. And I, I may be mispronouncing some of these names. Um, sorry about that if I do. I'm trying to not do that, but you know, it's an ongoing uh, task to get the pronunciations right. Another example of choosing the right species, that it, this is a milkweed. This is the one called common milkweed or Asclepias syriaca. Excellent plant for the monarch butterfly because it has lots, um, it has lots of big leaves. It grows fast and tall every single year. It spreads rampantly. It takes over. So that's a good reason to plant it if you have the space, the openness, a great big backyard. That's a good reason to use that one. But in a smaller landscape or subdivision, this plant would not, it, it would not be what I call well behaved. So uh, knowing whether that is the case or not, 
and we'll get to a long list and um, make access to which plants are well behaved before I finish talking. <clears throat> I always like to mention goldenrod because I think goldenrod needs to be in every single yard in America. If we could re-landscape America, this would be my top number one choice for a perennial to get in all spaces. But uh, there are about 27 different or so, maybe it's, I've heard different numbers, 25, 26, 27, different species of goldenrod that are native in our, to the Ozarks or to our region. And I only know of four, I used to say three, but I discovered another one that I think is well behaved enough to use in a designed intentional landscape. These are two, the uh, Solidago, Solidago rugosa and the Drummondii are both good for um, flower beds and manicured landscapes. These two also, and this is a good, good one because it handles some shade. And I'm always looking for things that bloom in the shade because I live in the woods and I still love flowers. And it's a little trickier to get flowers in the shade. This is my newest one that I think is well behaved enough or manageable enough. It may reseed and spread a little bit, but if you pull weeds at all, this one is what I call manageable. That's another word for well behaved. So those are the four that I think of for well behaved goldenrods. Now, <clears throat> many of the native plants colonize, and that is part of their um, MO for survival. I think it, it, um, colonizing plants certainly have their place in landscape designs, but you really have to know that they're going to colonize before you put them in the wrong place. I had a friend ask me to help. He had a five acre yard. Now that's quite a yard and he was mowing a lot of it. And he decided he got interested, he is interested in natives and decided he was going to he wanted to shrink all that mowing, which is a good thing to do. And he wanted to support pollinators and uh, our local ecosystem. So what we came up, he came up with the idea and I came up with the list of, uh, he wanted to plant batch after batch of uh, these plants and more that colonize. And then every year he lets those colonies get a little bit bigger and it takes up a little bit more of grass so that he is mowing around these large colonies of larger perennials. So I thought that was an excellent way to deal with a five acre yard. So knowing that it colonizes is an important thing to do. Now I have a much longer list. I, this was just some of the highlights. If you get in touch with me and I'll give you my email at the end of this, and you're interested in this list of plants that colonize, I'll send you the longer list. <clears throat> so colonizing plants have great purposes when you are land, uh, designing, depending on the size of the space. Uh, this is a sh an excellent um, native plant that is full of pollinators when it is bloom in bloom. But this drove us crazy at the botanical gardens up in the native garden because every year we had to do thick, thick cardboard. I'm trying to get my cursor to work around this plant and then mulch on top of that and it still sent runners everywhere. I went to visit about two months ago at the botanical gardens and I saw that they finally dug this shrub up because the, it was a maintenance nightmare in that particular spot. Excellent plant for erosion control um, and the, when you have these colonies of plants, especially if you mix up the uh, species that's in, the, in the, each of these uh, colonized spaces, it, makes, it mimics natural habitats and makes for great shelter for the wildlife. So that would be a good way to use colonizing plants. <clears throat> Last example of colonizing plant. I love sassafras and they're turning colors right now. They're just so beautiful out in the woods and along the roads, but I would not recommend planting this tree within 30 feet of a flower bed 
the way it survives is to form these colonies. Now this is a good use in a bigger space because you can tell that it, they mow around this. So sassafras will be one of the plants or trees that my friend that asked to help me to help him with the, um, his five acre yard will possibly he'll get some of more sassafras going. So just know if it's a colonizing plant that that's another word for not necessarily well behaved. You would not want to put it. It does have its uses and its places to be used, but not necessarily in a small yard or certainly not in a flower bed. <clears throat> so I bet you're all in the background saying, where do we go to find all these lists? And these, these are some of my favorite places to look things up. And so I wanted to share a little bit about that with you. If you just type in the genus and species name into your search engine, then you will get choices and you choose the Missouri Botanical Garden to click on, you, you will find great information about each and every plant that you type in. And there's another, uh, I'm gonna talk about this in a few slides. There's something else that I love about the Missouri Botanical Gardens. These are both, there are plenty of others. I bet Eric would have some that he would, and Nate, that they, that they are maybe their favorites. I encourage you to actually treat these three like they are a book almost and sit down and just peruse these garden, I mean, these websites, and you will be so impressed with the uh, the uh, options of things that you can learn and the things you can click on to research your plants in all of those. Now this is, you've uh, Nate mentioned and Eric mentioned and anybody who has heard me talk knows that I talk about well-behaved natives. I've been working on this list that I call well-behaved natives for years. I constantly uh, edit the list and update it but this is where you can go to find that list at the Botanical Garden of the Ozarks website. And you have to click on the Learn tab, Native Plant Info, and then the word, it says Handout Well-Behaved Natives. It's in a PDF form if you wanna print it out. It's about 10 pages long. And the last page is a page of nothing but websites and places to order seeds and plants, et cetera. I also, so that's where you can find any of the plants that I mentioned that are called well-behaved natives. And I edit it constantly. So I want to, uh, I would suggest that if you print it out or use it as a resource, uh, once a year in the beginning of every year, I will update it on the Botanical Garden of the Ozarks website. Or if you want the latest version, you can email me and I'll send it to you. <clears throat> I, this is where I go when I am not sure if a plant is native or not. And I'm still learning about all of these things. I research constantly. I think it's fun. This stands for Biota of North America Program. And this is a plant atlas. I want to, I think that's, no, this next up is for us to talk about the Missouri Botanical Garden. If you type this, this phrase into your search engine, then this is what will come up. Let's say you want, I encourage you to click on Missouri natives because they will give you non-natives if you don't click on natives. And say we wanted a shade tree for my shallow dry rocky soil. And they will give me a list of options. Not every single, they miss a few, but they give a good list. So if you have, if you want to design a uh, plan, a rain garden, then uh, just click on rain garden and they'll give you lots of choices. But you want a, uh, let's say you want, um, let's see. You know, you can click on the different things and then pull up, just play with it. It's lots of fun and it gives you, I really trust the Missouri Botanical Garden. They have been doing research for years. They have money to pay researchers, so they have done an excellent job of having accurate information. Um, I'm, I don't think I've ever disagreed with any of their information. Uh, I really like what they, and here's one that some will be interested in, deer tolerant plants. So if you want a rain garden that's deer tolerant, click on that and see what comes up. 
it's a great uh, resource to, and fun to use. So I wanted to explain a little more about the BONAP website and how to use that. <clears throat> so if, if you go to your search engine and type in hydrangea BONAP, in other words, the genus name and then just the word BONAP, don't type in the species. This is, this is the genus and that's the species. So just type in the genus name and what you will find is some choices. You will want to click on the choice that has this word county in it and genus and then county in it. And once you click on that, several maps will pop up and it will show you every single plant in the United States and every county. And there is just so much you can learn from understanding this map. Get, to, get familiar with the color key. So what we learn here is that the range in which I, I, I was uh, Googling hydrangea quercifolia, which is oak leaf hydrangea, the range that it will grow in is the dark green, but where you find it naturally growing as a native plant is the bright green. So what you learn here is that it's not truly native to Northwest Arkansas. You're not gonna find oak leaf hydrangea out in the woods. So there's a lot you can learn from using this map. Uh, one more slide that shows this map. Um, this is the hydrangea paniculata, which is used a lot in landscape designs. But what you learn here is that it's a non-native. This bright blue means non-native. So you'll have to get familiar. It's an easy color key. I don't understand why they didn't put it in Arkansas also. But when you see a map that has all that blue, you know you are looking or you have just purchased maybe a non-native plant. So I encourage people to research, research, research before you go buy native plants and you will be much more successful and happy and have a much better outcome with what you end up with. <clears throat> so maintenance is a big issue and understanding maintenance is a, a big thing to do well, understand before you go purchase plants. Here is a small example. This is a rain garden. I think it's a lovely rain garden, um, but this is a little, what I would consider requires a little bit of maintenance. So if you are designing for yourself or you are a, land, a landscape architect and you're designing for a customer, if you design a flower bed that looks like this, this is going to require some maintenance. Somebody's gonna to have to keep the grass out of there, pull the weeds, possibly mulch it until it gets very thick. Uh, these are going to turn brown. So just know that um, perennial pollinator beds are not maintenance free. If you want a maintenance free rain garden, I would suggest that you lean toward native trees and shrubs. They are, uh, you could plant an entire rain garden. It wouldn't be as interesting, but it could be nothing but say button bush, which is a wonderful rain garden plant. Uh, so right, you do not have to always do the pollinator plants. We do encourage pollinator plants, but there are some wonderful trees that are particularly early in the season when a lot of these herbaceous perennials have not, uh, are not blooming yet. There are many early blooming trees and shrubs that will support the pollinators early in the season. And native trees and shrubs are going to be less maintenance than herbaceous perennial beds. <clears throat> so I am gonna talk a little bit about maintenance because it is such a big issue for uh, people who are growing native plants and people are always talking to me about it. So this is in reference to spring blooming native perennials only. Once they bloom, almost all perennials will turn brown like this. So do you need to leave this? There are reasons to leave it and I'll talk about that in a minute, but you do not have to leave it. If it's in your backyard and nobody sees it, no big deal, you can leave it. But if it bothers you, if it's at your front entrance or if it's at the entrance to a commercial building, having this look in a com at the entrance of almost any space would not be acceptable for most people. If there's a lot of this in your yard, your neighbors may not like this. Now this is an issue that gets talked about quite a bit. What I do want to say is yes, you may cut this off and there are some options of things to do with these dried seed heads 
and reasons to leave, which I'm gonna talk about in a minute. But I also wanna point out that some of these perennials, if you cut them down to the basal leaves, once they bloom, after they're ratty looking like this, and you cut them back to the basal leaves, there are a handful that will rebloom, and purple coneflower is one of those that will rebloom. Here are two more that will rebloom. The common yarrow gets, looks fried after, <clears throat> excuse me, let me get some liquid. <clears throat> it turns brown and crispy looking after it blooms, the common yarrow does. So does this one. This is one of my favorite herbaceous perennials native perennials. Uh, no book will tell you that you should cut this off, but this was at the Botanical Gardens, and in public garden is a good example of a space where it's not acceptable to have dried up, dead, messy looking perennials everywhere. So we cut it back out of necessity, and lo and behold, it bloomed again in fall. I had never read that in any book, but we learned that, and now I tell people all the time, cut it back and it'll bloom twice. And then that is good nectar and, and pollinator food uh, for the pollinator insects later in the year. <clears throat> now, I, and this I want to address, this is addressing fall blooming perennials. Another issue that I hear people talk about quite a bit is that they don't like the floppy look um, and it's too messy or it's inappropriate. Now this is the, parking lot at the Botanical Gardens, and these two were right next to each other. You know, there's a street through here. And this one, uh, we, we did an experiment to see what would happen. Uh, we cut it back, at, and we call this giving it a spring haircut, and the time to do this is, is in May. It only applies to the fall blooming perennials, and by that I mean the perennials that bloom uh, maybe the end of July, August, September, and October. All of those, and many of those native perennials end up being tall. So this is a good way to um, handle that. You can cut them back, give them a spring haircut at the uh, in uh, any time in May. We did that here at the same time, and this one got cut back and pruned, and this one did not. And Two weeks later, there were as many blooms on this group as there were over here. And, but you can see here, this one is much stouter. It's not floppy. This is a sidewalk right here, so it would not be good to have them flopping over in the sidewalk. <clears throat> so that's a technique you can use for any native perennial that is too taller than you want it to be, or it is floppy and bloom, as long as it blooms in the uh, fall season. This is a list of some of the perennials that are late blooming, but just check out when it blooms, um, end of July, August, September, October, and all of those can get the spring haircut for a tidier look. If that's what you need, if that's what's appropriate for the spot you're dealing with. <clears throat> so here's some of the reasons, and there are many good reasons to wait until spring. This is in reference to the fall cleanup. And this is the season we're in right now, where a lot of gardeners like to get out there and rake those leaves and cut things back. But one of the things that's distressing about that is that we have spent all this energy planting these native plants and and encouraging you know rain gardens and butterfly gardens and then we come along in the fall and we cut all this back and we rake the leaves and so what we have done is take away the winter homes for many many beneficial insects so we kill the insects that we spent three quarters of our time trying to advance so um, leaving the seed heads it, uh, is good food for the birds. It's, this is, the messier it is, the better uh, over winter homes this makes for the beneficial insects and for wildlife. But it's not absolutely necessary to have this look. There are some choices of things that we can do so that we can coexist and have with healthy ecosystems. And that's what I, I've, is part of what we need to do in some of our man more manicured spaces. You can leave this if it's appropriate, if it's in your backyard, if your neighbors aren't complaining, 
um, you can leave this and that's just fine. But if you want to clean it up, here's some options. <clears throat> now, this is a small example of taking all that dried business and putting, making a, a creative yard art arrangement with it and using different kinds of containers is just one example of something you can do. As long as these seed heads are upright, the birds will still eat them. Uh, if you put, if you use some, whatever container you use, be sure it's stabilized, like with the heavy rock, or you might bury this a third in, you know, in a hole so that it doesn't topple over. If it's lying on the ground, well, the ground loving overwintering and beneficial insects will like it, but the ones that prefer it to be upright, like the goldfinches that like to, they end up lighting their, I, I keep losing, there. They will land right on top of that and eat those seeds in the winter time. It's really a fun thing to watch those little birds. So you can just be creative and create yard art and there are things, that's one th option of dealing with the dried mess for fall cleanup if that's what you need to do. <clears throat> one of the things I need to point out for the fall cleanup, now this doesn't apply when you are cutting the spring bloomers down, you cut those down to the basal root, uh, leaves. But if you are doing fall cleanup, don't cut your stems down on any of your plants um, lower than about 18 inches. So most of you know who Doug Talame is. He's kind of like the, the uh, guru of native plants in the southeast part of our country. Uh, he's done research that shows that the overwintering habit of the insects that do overwinter in the hollow stems they do that in, from 18 inches down. So if you leave your sticks that you cut back to eight, 12 to 18 inches, then you are, not just, you are still allowing for winter homes. I thought this was just pretty cute. It, you can also have it messy, but I advise that you put this in the back corner somewhere out of sight. Again, the messier you leave it, the better. And having a rotten log in every yard is a good thing for beneficial insects too, particularly beetles. There are all kinds of creatures that get through the winter if you have messes, if you have leaves, and if you have a rotten log. So just knowing how they overwinter and, and think about how can I clean up a little bit and coexist with the creatures that I love and I'm trying to advance their numbers, increase their numbers, that will uh, help these insects and it's a, the compromise we need to come up with. So the Xerces Society, if you haven't heard of that, um, it'll be on my resource page. <clears throat> it's a great, um, uh, a great thing to look at. They have lots of good information. But they are doing a campaign called Leave the Leaves because it, and, and they have all these different folders and flyers that let people know that a luna moth cannot get through the winter. It, it overwinters as a cocoon in fallen leaves. So we need to abandon the practice of burning our leaves and chewing up leaves. When you do that, you are chewing up the creatures that overwinter in those fallen leaves. You can rake the leaves and use them for mulch in your flower beds. You can pile them up in a corner. You can bag them shortly. Don't keep them in a hot black plastic bag in the sunshine because you will solarize every insect in that bag. But you can put them in the brown paper bags that the city provides and give them to your neighbors to use for mulch. Try to use as many of the leaves as you can if you are going to do the fall cleanup. That's the point of what I'm saying. <clears throat> so to summarize maintenance, uh, just keep in mind that flowering trees and shrub are, are less maintenance than the pollinator beds or the, uh, or the butterfly gardens. All those things are necessary and we're glad if you have the time and energy to pull weeds and keep them attractive. But one of the things that I think we need to think about as we are planting these spaces in our yards is that we want to influence our neighbors in a positive way. And if there is too much mess, I can't tell you how many people come up, talk to me about 
how they just don't think they can live with all those messy native plants in their yard. And I'm here to say they don't have to be messy. There are techniques and things we can do to have attractive native plants in our yards. So now I want to speak specifically to the growers uh, that are listening, that are part of the high tunnel program. Uh, the, <clears throat> instead of just having fun, and I mean, if you can afford to do that, have fun <laughs> and learn all that you need to about growing things. But I highly encourage you to know where you're going to be selling your plants. Um, are you going to grow these plants and then sell them at a farmer's market? Uh, are you going to try to sell them to some of the landscape companies, landscape contractors directly? Uh, are, you, are you doing it for a native plant sale? Know who your market is, and then if it's a restoration project, then you're probably going to lean toward growing prairie plants. So that's what I mean by knowing who your market is. Now I, oh, here I wanted to, um, this was what I was shaking my head about. Uh, these are, I, we encourage people to get their seeds or their plants as close to home as possible. And I won't go in, I'm not good at explaining science at all, but it, it's important to get what we call local ecotype seeds and plants. In other words, plants that have co-evolved in our area and they are already adjusted to our area. So get plants and seeds as close to home as possible. And here are some actual sources for seeds. I think Nate mentioned these, the Hamilton Outpost, uh, Missouri Wildflowers Nursery. They actually come uh, south to Arkansas, to Northwest Arkansas to collect a lot of their wildflower seeds. So a lot of their seeds are, uh, local. And what's exciting about the high tunnel program is that we hope to get more and more people raising native plants in the area so we can collect our seeds more locally. And we're not quite there yet. The demand, there is a much bigger demand for native plants and native seeds than we have a supply for. But just get your plants and your seeds as close to home as possible. This is the project that many of you know, Jennifer Ogles. She is um, <clears throat> one of the primary people in our area that is working on native seed projects. And this will be where she will be, uh, her seeds that she is actively collecting this fall. And she told me a, a couple of days ago when I texted her that Roundstone Native Seed will be where they will be selling through that company. So that is, um, you know, next year, that's exciting that we, and hopefully more and more we have uh, sources of plant material. Now, if you are one of the high tunnel people listening and you are going to have something to sell yet next year or whenever, please get in touch with me and let me know what you're up to and what you're doing because as I give these talks to people, I wanna know if there are more people selling plants in the area let, let me know how you're doing it, where you'll be doing it, and when you'll be doing that. that and then I can, I can put your name out there. So that is part of what we are excited about. All of these on this side will be selling plants. Um, <clears throat> and of course, there, most of you that are listening probably already know about the Northwest Arkansas Master Naturalist Group. Um, they are doing a wonderful service of supplying Northwest Arkansas with more and more native plants and many, and they have, well, COVID has changed things, but they usually have four plant sales a year. <clears throat> so, oh, all right. So I met my, uh, what I call my wish list. Now I'm gonna go through this pretty quick because I can see that I've used up most of my time. But if anybody is interested in getting uh, my longer wish list, uh, please email me and ask for it. I would love to work with anybody who wants to be a grower. Uh, I do understand the landscaping and the designed end of the business. And there are, I'm gonna show you 10 slides of plants that I wish I could find either bigger or, um, even fine. Now this one's a tough one to even find at all. It's a great landscaping plant that Eric mentioned. It, and uh, you can, 
I think the master naturalists grew it, but almost everything that's a perennial from them, and this is kind of a woody perennial, it, um, it, it's only, you can only purchase it in a very small size. Landscape contractors and people who are buying native plants and designing with them, many of them would love to have three gallon plants. So if you have a setup where you can grow your plants longer into at least a two gallon plant, you can sell them for more money, of course. So I'm willing to correspond with anybody who wants to um, talk about that, but I'll move along on my wish list. Uh, now, don't, don't confuse Amorpha canescens with Amorpha fruticosa. This is an excellent plant, uh, but it gets real big in one year. It is not on my well-behaved natives list. Amorpha canescens is on my well-behaved natives list, I think. I need to go check that. Um, but, I mean, New Jersey tea is an excellent plant that is hard to find of size. Only think I think you could find it in a court maybe, but if someone's land doing a landscape job, courts are not usually what they want to start off with. That's a great example. This is in seed right now. This this will turn heads. It is covered in uh, these red seed heads. It looks like roses from a distance, little bitty red roses or berries. It's just exquisite looking and I've never seen it sold in a big size, only in quartz. Another good example is wafer ash, which is, um, I think that's a host plant. Many of the plants I mentioned are host plant, but this is a host to the giant swallowtail and um, it is an excellent landscape plant. Um, I did not just show slide after slide of landscape plants because I thought you could look on the well-behaved natives list if that's what you want to do and then type in the uh, genus and species name in Google Images and you can look at the entire 10 page list if that's what you want to do. But <clears throat> it's there for you to use as a resource if that suits the way you, your brain works. Here's another, I've never seen this sold anywhere. It's in the wild, I love it. It has shiny green leaves. It's one of the last plants to lose its green leaves in the fall. Uh, right now it has red berries and they will turn black and, and it is certainly good food for wild birds and wildlife. So I wish this would be an excellent plant. It's very prunable or shapeable. Uh, you can make all native plants denser and less rangy looking if you prune them but I've never seen it sold anywhere. I would love to find some of this. I'm gonna dig some little ones up out of my own woods this year, but um, landscapers would be using it if they could find it bigger. This is just so striking. Who wouldn't wanna use this in a bigger, but again, you can only find it in maybe a gallon quart if we're, uh, is typical. Uh, I've mentioned the cliff goldenrod. This is one of my favorites to use in designs because it looks somewhat like a shrub. It gets about the size of a two by two shrub and um, every garden needs to have a uh, goldenrod in it to support all the wildlife that it supports. This is, I've meant, I showed you this one already. I love this one. Uh, now last year, this sp early spring, or was it last year? I don't remember. I think it was early spring. White River Nursery had this one in two gallon plants. And, and I, they had either, um, you know, 30 to 50 of these and they did not last long. They sold out very quickly. So uh, this is an example of what I mean. If we get some of our native plants in bigger sizes, um, they will have, I think landscapers and designers would be designing them in more. This is just a tough, excellent plant. And um, looking at this slide reminds me, this is one thing that I wanna mention, that when you read the, uh, when you look these plants up and you're trying to find information about how big they grow and whether or not they need sunshine or whatever, um, the books will tell you this one is um, three to four feet. Well, in typical soil, that's true. At the botanical gardens in the native plant garden, we've let that garden get a little too rich. And this one was probably 
four to five feet. And in my home, in the rocky, shallow, poor soil, it only grows two feet. So keep that in mind when you're looking things up and designing the, uh, the worse the soil is, the shallower the soil is, the, the native plant might grow a little shorter. And if it's in richer, um, deeper soil, it might grow a little bit taller. This is, again, one though that you could shear and give a spring haircut in spring, and um, it will be stouter and shorter and still bloom. That is my last slide. I oh, I wanted to mention that um, support, if, if you're just listening and you're not much of a gardener, uh, and at least support the organizations that help promote landscaping with native plants. As you were told by Nate, uh, Eric is the president and I'm the vice president of Wild Ones. And the, uh, what excites me about Wild Ones is their main focus is teaching, helping people, promoting uh, landscaping in more manicured settings with native plants. And so, but all of these are good organizations and, and, and supporting them, joining them, just helps promote landscaping with native plants. So I'm gonna go back to a different slide and let uh, Nate, I need to unshare my screen. Do I need to do stop share and let Nate take over with questions, I think. Did I do the right thing? Not yeah. <clears throat> yeah, that looks good. Okay. Uh, we do have a couple questions for you, Lissa. Mm -hmm. uh, one person is asking any ideas what you would plant instead of the blue sage uh, planted in the old vegetable plot? Well, there are, um, I, I, I'm out to turn my old vegetable plot into a, a um, butterfly garden, into a perennial pollinator garden. And so I just have to avoid the ones that prefer lean soil like the blue sage. I've got some rudbeckia in there, lots, I've got two or a couple of different kinds, maybe three kinds of, of um, milkweed for the monarchs. I've got some, so there are lots and lots of choices, but if you read in, when you're looking things up that it prefers lean soil, then you don't wanna plant it in a rich soil. There are tons of pollinator plants and pollinator garden list, and um, possibly looking more on the web. I'm trying to think of some other things. I, oh, I do have some, I'm trying the Monarda, the Bee Balm, Bradburiana, because I have read that it is, the least aggressive of all the bee bombs. And I don't want to have anything that takes over my garden. Um, so you just have to keep that in mind. If you were the kind of gardener that is not going to get out there and thin things down or, or cut things in half or weed, then you need to really ab avoid the aggressive plants. I've got a, a button bush in my butterfly garden. Let's see, I've got some, uh, what else do I have in there that's working well? Oh, I'm, I'm yeah, I'm, my brain's too tired to answer more. <laughs> what else? <clears throat> and uh, Phyllis is asking, how far down did you cut the Indian pink? Well, I, because that, when you are do, cutting a plant that has done its spring bloom or real early summer, you cut it down to the basal, leaves, which usually is about three or four inches, uh, just to the leaves that grow along the ground. You don't want to have nothing green there. I mean, there are some natives, you could cut it to the ground and it wouldn't matter. That is the case with um, the asters, from what I have experienced. We, in, uh, we got a disease on one of our asters at the botanical gardens and we literally cut it to the ground to get rid of the disease. And that year was the prettiest asters we had in the fall. It, they were the size and they, people thought they were purple mums. They were so tight and, and they were only about 18 inches, which was unusual for an aster. So I don't recommend cutting your perennials to the ground, literally. Uh, I say three or four inches at the lowest. It, that's a general rule. <laughs> okay, and it uh, looks like we have one, one last question and then Carrie's going to make an announcement. Um, Ellis is asking, should you cut back milkweed? And uh, I, would, I would be curious to know when, when you would recommend that. 
Well, there are two answers to that. It depends on if you're after the seeds and then no, if, you, if you're wanting to harvest the milkweed seed, then don't cut it back. What we did learn at the botanical gardens, however, is that, so milkweed, leave it alone, it blooms in the late spring or early summer. And then after it blooms, it gets brown and ratty looking and it gets tough, the, the leaves get tough. So, and the monarchs are moving further north. They've traveled already further north. So it, but when they, because we were a public garden and there were some places where we did not want that brown fried looking perennial right there, we went ahead and cut the, some of them, we left about half of them, let half of them go to seed and half of them we cut back to about the basil leaves, about three inches. And what we, what happened was that they came back with new, fresh, tender foliage. And when the monarchs began to travel south again in the late summer and fall, that was their first plant they wanted to go to and lay eggs on. They do lay a egg at the, at the, as they're traveling. It's a very unusual thing. But that was where they wanted to go first because the monarchs prefer tender foliage. So the ones that were around to lay the eggs went for the tender foliage. And that's what we created by cutting the, the milkweed back. So it depends on whether or not, if you want to collect the seed heads, don't cut it back. If you want to give the monarch some new, fresh, tender growth to eat on, and it actually gave it a, it was more food for them to eat as they were um, migrating south. So it was, we decided it was a good thing to do, and we had enough Orange milkweed is the one I'm talking about now. There are so many different kinds of milkweed. I ass is that what the um, person meant? Orange milkweed? The, I think it was um, just milkweed in general. And well, uh, what, it, what time did you cut it back? Right after it got ugly blooms. After the blooms were ugly we, and it looked fried, we cut it back. All right, that's great information. Um, in the chat window, uh, our outreach coordinator, Carrie, posted um, a comment about our YouTube channel. Um, like I said, for everyone who's registering and uh, watching us on Zoom right now, uh, this is going to be available uh, up until the time it's, it's uploaded to YouTube, which would be sometime next week. Um, you can view this online at that point on uh, youtube.com uh, slash user slash beaver watershed. And uh, we would look forward to, to uh, you seeing it on there. Um, wow, that was some fantastic information today. I, I learned quite a bit myself. Um, thank you very much, Eric and Lissa. Those were both fantastic presentations. And uh, thank you. Yeah, yeah thank I'm you. Nick. Yeah, and uh, thank you, Carrie, for helping coordinate this. And uh, certainly, thanks for everyone who who attended and, and watched this uh, here in Zoom and, and uh, on Facebook. This is this is our new reality now, dealing with uh, uh, virtual webinars and virtual workshops. I mean, thank y'all for bearing with us there. Um, uh, and uh, I would like to uh, just let anyone know who lives in the Beaver Watershed. Um, we do have the grant program for the high tunnels. And uh, if you're interested in, in that, then please feel free to shoot me an email inquiring about it. It's uh, nate at beaverwatershedalliance.org. I'd be happy to, to help you with that or answer any other questions you might have. Um, uh, if anyone's got any final questions, uh, I don't see any. All right. Well, we're going to end our uh, Facebook Live session. And uh, y'all, thank you very much. We hope to see you back at uh, some of our other programs. There's uh, Check our calendar out. And um, be sure to register for the other three programs in this series and check out some of the, some of the other awesome things we're doing. Well, Thank you very much and uh, have a great week and hopefully you have a good weekend.